The Siege Tower is probably the most well-known siege engine used in movies and video games. It's a massive wooden construct normally covered in some sort of animal skin or in even more advanced periods, metal. But how is this massive formidable engine of war actually used in combat? Well, let's dive deeper into history and see where it leads. The first ever recorded use of a siege tower is in the 9th century BC by the Neo-Assyrian Empire. This empire, considered by many historians as the first world empire, spanned from modern day Lebanon and Israel all the way into modern day Syria and Iraq, and was very powerful, hence its ability to build such a mighty siege engine. The first use of a siege tower shows us being employed as an archer platform to raise above the battlements to fire missiles down on its defenders to clear the walls, not the standard use, such in many films, as a troop delivery system. This use of an archer tower was very important as it allowed things like battering ram and troops on the ground to move into the walls to try and breach the defences. We don't know much about its construction because the information has been lost to time, but it's very interesting to see this, and it's very important to know that even at this time they knew the advantage of using archers to clear the walls, because if you did not do such a thing, you'd take massive casualties on the ground, at which point the siege would not be very tenable. So if you take too many casualties, in the long run, you would lose the war. As the siege tower idea spread throughout the ancient world, we'll see many variations, each with their own merits. We have the massive Helopopolis, meaning taker of cities, used in the siege of Rhodes by the Macedonians. This 135 foot tall and 67.5 feet wide monster was so big it had nine levels and required a rack and pinion, which was a fairly complicated piece of engineering, to be employed to move such a massive siege engine. The nine platforms also had various missile launching weapons, like early ballisters to rain down death on the defenders. Once again, it was an archer platform, but this time it was mobile, and it was not a troop delivery system, but it was designed again for clearing the walls. Even though this siege tower was successful, it was still defeated when the ground in front of it was flooded by the defenders, showing the major weaknesses of such a colossal machine. These early siege towers also housed battering rams in their lower levels, in attempts to damage or even breach the walls. Even though it may seem fruitless to batter a stone wall, in time it would be weakened and with enough force, all walls crumble. The defeat of a massive siege tower also showed that they needed proper support in certain conditions to be successful. These conditions were flat ground, which was not too boggy or loose in the case of sandy terrain, no obstacles such as moats, rivers or siege ditches, which would make it topple over, and the defenders not having large missile throwing devices, such as catapults or bullister, which would tear the tower to pieces with their powerful missiles. Siege towers could also be employed in naval combat, but whether they would be mounted on larger ships to provide a tall platform for archers to destroy the enemy defenders. These were risky, as sudden waves could knock the ship, causing a dangerous situation on such a high platform, but the ship did give unparalleled mobility, so it could be moved up and down the defenders' walls and towers that bordered the sea or rivers. This meant the towers were a far better investment than siege towers on land, and they were still used for archers not delivering troops, which is something that's greatly surprised me, as, in, as you see in most TV and series, it's always a very large tower goes in and delivers some heavily armed troops. But for the time where heavily armed troops were kind of in short supply as well, and archers were more common, especially missile throwers and slingers, it means the siege tower was their primary platform and used to clear the walls. I've got to say, it's a very interesting thing to see because it'd be nice to see TV and series show this more, not as a big shock tactic weapon, but actually use them to clear the defender's walls so things like battering rams could move in and be a lot more realistic. But whether that'll ever happen, uh, we'll see. In the Roman Empire, there was some unique use of the siege towers in that they were built smaller than the walls they needed to break into, but mo mo mobile. And the Roman forces would build multiple ramps so the towers could be shifted around to keep the defenders moving and to cause disorder. It was a smart tactic that needed a lot of preparation, but it could work. One major problem of building ramps to help your siege towers was that the defenders could undermine them. This involved digging tunnels underneath your own walls and then under where the ramps were, which would then cause a collapse when too much weight was above it. This would then obviously cause the siege tower and any troops above it to collapse into the ground, causing death and major casualties among the attacking forces. As the medieval period began to roll in, the siege tower known as a belfry had become far more popular. As the engineering had advanced and they used to break particularly well-defended castles and cities were a good investment, especially to avoid a lengthy siege. But still the siege tower's weaknesses were well known. This meant further siege engines needed to be developed to help the siege tower do its job. 
The sieging forces now employed armoured sewers, which were wooden and sometimes metal walls on a slant normally attached to wheels. These would also be carried in some cases. The main job of these sewers was to defend the ground troops from missiles such as arrows and rocks, so they could advance towards the walls to fill in obstacles such as moats or ditches with dirt. This was very important, as without these obstacles being filled, the siege tower had no chance of closing in on the defenders. But it wasn't just uneven terrain that was causing danger to the siege towers and the attackers. Sometimes these moats would be filled with wooden stakes, and in some cases, the moats tended to have static water directly from the sewage systems or just you know, general waste being thrown into them, which meant they were extremely unhygienic. It was very common for the people who went into the moats to get things such as dysentery or even worse problems. And filling these obstacles was a timely protest, and the sows only offered limited protection. But they did the job well enough for the attackers to be effective at clearing these obstacles and then advancing towards the walls. To actually move these machines required the strength of dozens of men pushing from the base to move them, and after the use of rack and pivot, gave way to things like wheels, thanks to better engineering skills in the medieval period. It was still a tough job, and a risky one, as they were still exposed at the side and the rear to enemy missile fire. And if the defenders sallied forth to try and sabotage the siege engine, it was normally the lightly defended men pushing the tower that got caught in the combat and normally were killed or badly wounded. The siege towers were still used as platforms for archers and missile throwers, some being huge constructs with hundreds of men and multiple missile throwers operating from them in unison. But the siege tower had entered a new use. Now the most well-known use of it was the delivery of combat troops to the top of the defenders' walls so they could storm the defences and attempt to break through. This new use of the tower also changed its design, and instead of being built to tower above the defences, it would now be made level so that the tower could reach the walls, it could then drop its retractable bridge. Think a miniature drawbridge, and then a complement of troops stationed in the tower could advance forward and attempt to clear the walls and break through into the siege. But this was not as easy as the tower was an easy target, and it would attract the attention of the defenders' missile throwers, and normally the defenders would form upon the walls where the siege tower was about to land, and be ready to repel the invading forces. Even if the attackers were successful to make a foothold on the walls, the reinforcements would have to climb multiple ladders up through the levels of the tower, and it would take time for them to actually reach and help them. And there was great risk of the defences killing the initial first wave of the tower, and then storming the tower back, and destroying it, and killing everyone aboard it. On a personal note, I believe the use of siege towers as a troop delivery method also became more popular, as the use of heavily armoured troops in plate armour gave them a shock trooper style force available to smash a defending force on the walls through the use of these small elite units. This is not to say heavy infantry weren't present in more ancient times, but even in the Roman era the heavy infantry were no comparison to the medieval style knights with full plate armour, which were basically a walking tank, and the standard soldier had very little chance against these heavily armoured and very skilled opponents. There was also the risk of fire being used to destroy the siege towers as they approached, this happened in the Third Crusade when the Christian forces seized the city of Acre, and part of their assault was to use multiple siege towers to attempt to take the walls. This was stopped when the Muslim defenders used fire most likely in the form of arrows or in parts to ignite the siege tower causing their destruction. The remedy of this was to cover the towers in wet leather or some sort of flame retardant material, but still the risk of fire was always there as these were massive wooden constructs and unfortunately it's very difficult to make wood fireproof, especially in more ancient times. There were many variations in siege tower, and they were normally built on site to crack a specific defensive position, which meant they varied greatly in their size and use, and even materials used as normally would be constructed on site with what was available, and depending on the skills of the engineers and smithies available to the attacker. This would also impact the quality of the tower, as someone such as a duke or king would have access to such skilled individuals, but maybe someone as a lowly lord would have less skilled um, people in his court or even in his army to help him construct such a mighty siege engine. And unlike today, there was no easy access to the internet. Maybe there would have been some, you know, books or manuscripts able to provide some help in this, but most of the knowledge able to be used to build a siege tower would be passed down from, you know, engineers, families, or smithy to smithy. So either you knew how to build one, or you didn't, unfortunately. Even with the invention of the cannon and gunpowder weapons becoming more widespread, the siege tower now found new uses. Even though the defenders' walls and towers had been nullified by the power of the cannons, and you no longer needed things like siege towers to get archers above their positions or deliver troops to them, there was the use in using them as fire support towers for cannons, so they could be mounted on them. These are now called battery towers, and they were still used into the early 1600s, I could see. 
They're very useful to give you clear line of sight for the cannons, as now things such as reverse slopes and other obstacles were being built by the defenders to try and block line of sight of the cannons. So to give height to the cannon meant you could easily hit the walls, towers, and then rain death upon the defenders inside the city or castle that you were attacking. But the time of the siege tower eventually came to an end, when large walls and castle-style fortifications were no longer commonplace. And when the ever-advancing power of firearms and explosive weapons, the siege tower had been long forgotten. But still to this day, it's probably the most iconic and popular siege equipment piece to be featured in films. And these massive and beautiful engines of wars always make an amazing spectacle to make these shows far more interesting to watch. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned a few things. I certainly did doing the research. Thank you for watching, everyone. And I'll see you on the next one.